you start the law it was you important i'll mute i'll mute you all for the time being you can unmute when you're ready hello everyone welcome very exciting to see you for those of you that have uh, joined our previous convention welcome back and uh, for those of you that it's your first of our online conventions welcome We're very happy to have you here very excited um, got a, a great set of sessions ahead of us and uh, we're going to jump into it pretty quick here. I just want to make sure that everybody who wants to join has joined. So I got a few people popping in the waiting room. So I'll just wait a minute. Everyone can get settled. Um, in the meantime, I will let you know, uh, we have provided a link to a, a break room of sorts that will be open in between the sessions. The link will be the same every day um, and we'll do breaks in between the first and second and the second and third sessions you should have gotten an email and it should have a clue and that would be one clue of a handful of clues that have been distributed 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 randomly among you as participants and if you want to you can take the opportunity to join those break rooms in between sessions and discuss with other participants until you collect all of the clues so that you can solve the puzzle the puzzle and have the opportunity to win a uh, ten dollar amazon gift card and everybody who solves the puzzle wins so um you know feel, feel free to solve the puzzle it's giving you something fun to do get everybody interacting i know we're in countries and states and all sorts of different places all over the world and would love to have you wonderful people get to know each other better. So make sure to participate um, in that. Okay, it looks like we've settled in. We've got most of our attendees ready to go. So uh, what I will be doing is I'll, I'll give an introduction to our guest today. And actually, oh, we got another folks still entering. Give an extra introduction to our host today. Um, his name is Paul McNulty. Currently, his screen says Viviana. That's his lovely partner um, who plays piano. Will also be be uh, speaking with us today. <laughs> and I'm going to bring. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, Paul. And I'll I'll spotlight your video. How do you do? Hey. I realize that. And I everyone you. should be able to to see Paul. And while he's over there waiting, I'm going to give an introduction so you can get to know a little bit more about Paul before he starts speaking. So Paul McNulty, he is a maker of world famous Forte pianos known for their superior performance quality used for concerts and recordings in the most prestigious concert halls, opera houses, and owned by prominent Forte piano players and leading music institutions such as Harvard University, Cornell University, Royal Academy of Music, and many more. Uh, we've had him before on Radio Hour, a very intelligent and ambitious fellow who makes fine instruments that are both lovely to listen to and to take a look at. So, Paul, um, why don't you go ahead and, and int introduce yourself and get started? Well, hello. I um, <clears throat> thank you for kind words. <clears throat> I'm building these pianos. <clears throat> Uh, up close to 300 of these things in the last 35 years. And, uh, well, I have a team of 10 people and we work, sort of everybody works a 50 hour a week. And it gets done. And we have any number of instruments underway at present, including two Graf pianos with six pedals and bells. And I was lucky to get a Graf recently original, 1828. <clears throat> and those bells, it has Janissary bells you bang on it. You press one pedal, which bangs a drum into the soundboard and simultaneously crashes a brass plate onto the bass strings and at the same moment plays three bells. Uh, and those three bells are tuned uh, on the lays. And it's interesting work to do. 
And my assistant has made yesterday a set of these. Oh, where did I start? Where did I study? Of course. Uh, uh, North Bennett Street Industrial School, 1978. And uh, there are other things going on. I could rattle on endlessly about pianos, but I think that the, uh, excuse me, what is it you want to say, Viviana? Hello, I'm, I'm a piano builder, yes. <laughs> no, I, maybe I'll just speak, yeah. Uh, I uh, would like to stress to, to people, I hope they will uh, always call me if they have a question about forte pianos and, and you know, getting the keyboard out can be challenging <clears throat> and fixing the broken hammer can be challenging. Uh, and I'm always available is what I want to say. And that's probably more important than where I've been. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, the thing that's interesting for me, of course, is now I'm doing 19th century French pianos involved with the Chopin Institute in Warsaw. And <clears throat> uh, there, there's a lot to learn and I'm lucky to have a, a few bits and pieces of old pianos here to study. It's like that. Maybe somebody has a question. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to open it up here to, to questions in several ways, folks. So if you want to type in the chat when you have questions, you're welcome to do that. Um, but also at, at a certain point, maybe we'll delay it a little bit, but you'll be able to unmute yourself perhaps and, and ask a question in person. Um, I think that I'd like to start off with some questions and then perhaps we can hand it off to other folks who'd like to uh, participate. And again, remember, you're welcome to put those in the chat and I'll, I'll pick out questions as they come in. And I'll, for those of you who aren't that familiar with Zoom, I'll put a little comment in here in the chat is right here. And you should have a little pop up that happens um, so you can see how to access that chat. So yeah, Paul, I think, um, one question that I've had have for you is um, in terms of do you do you already get people reaching out to you and, and asking you questions? And if so, you know, very rarely are they? And, yeah. OK. In, in, in if you do, who, pardon me, who do you say again? Who, if you if you do, who do you happen to be in touch with? Um, do you have a, any sort of ongoing relationships with folks at like a university or a concert hall with or, a technician yeah. really nobody but but uh you know malcolm bilson is involved with these things and he always has some technical question but that's because he's got an idea already and he wants wants me to wants me to listen to his idea uh that's on a different level than somebody who who has to get the piano ready in two hours and there's a broken hammer it's it's a different uh, that's the thing that's more important for me is is that uh, that general maintenance question and honestly uh and nobody calls <laughs> it, it, it's interesting that you that you're open to calls but i think i think from the perspective of a third party piano technician I think before getting to know you a little bit more personally, I would have thought, oh yeah, that guy, you know, doesn't need a call from me. <laughs> you know? well, uh, yeah. it, 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 I have one trade and this is vitally important to me. This, this uh, set to set up this communication. Otherwise I got to fly to Australia or something. It's true. Right, right. That's very That's useful great. information. Well, hopefully this convention will help in that opening up the lines of communications between you and folks. And I think especially those of us that steward the instruments at institutions, universities, concert halls, and things like that, um, if they don't already have period instruments, it's a great uh, relationship to open up with you. Well, there, you know, there are, there's a particular way to get it, to get it done right. And one example, if, if I may digress, is to, you know, f to fly to Canberra <clears throat> and meet with their technician and try to explain to him patiently that if he glues the hammer on with epoxy, 
a little bit sideways, it doesn't help anybody. And his answer was, I don't have time for stuff like this. And my what I didn't say was, I have time to fly halfway around the world to try to give you a little instruction. Uh, <clears throat> but that's one approach, and that's not a very pleasant uh, example. But the other is a, a piano in Walla Walla, Washington, which had seven broken hammers in the treble from the technician taking them out and gluing them on a little bit with animal, a little bit with tight bond, a little bit sideways. <clears throat> and what I did in the course of a day was to uh, keep filling a teacup with hot water and uh, removed the broken stems from the hammer heads and cleaned out the holes and went to the hardware store and bought some moldings and glued those onto the end of the seven broken hammer shanks and planed them somewhat round and glued them into the glued the hammers back onto properly, you know what I'm saying, constituted shanks in a line that they have to have a certain hammer line and travel straight up and down and not sideways. Those things are, are basic to everyone's understanding, but I want to say that you can do it with a simple, you need nothing more than a hand plane to get away with it. Uh, and I would like anyone to uh, listen to that. I would tell them. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry for my mic noise there. Um, I have some questions that are coming in the chat, so I'll start um, delivering yeah. those. One question, which, yeah, I don't know that I know the answer to exactly either. Are the terms piano forte and forte piano interchangeable? Piano forte is French and forte piano is Polish. And, and you, you can take one way or the other. It's just one way to make a distinction between uh, the pre- pre-Steinway world of piano, the, you know what I'm saying? History didn't sort of stop in 1870. It, it, I, you, I think you know what I mean. It's to distinguish a piano that may, may seem strange. They call it a forte piano. Piano forte doesn't matter. So in terms of the historical term, the historicity, I don't know what the right is, of the terms, yeah. the, the, the piano forte came later uh, after the, the, the idea the of you know the the uh, you know it came with the invention of the piano by Cristofori you know Gravi Cembalo called piano forte it's already there in the description of the harpsichord with loud and soft uh, and that's all it ever meant uh, and as far as distinguishing that I make forte pianos it means I don't make Steinways that's all it means yeah got it. Uh, next question here is from Ben, and he says, uh, do you work in conservation of old pianos as well, or only in sure. building repl replicas? More recently, as I have more time on my hands with my team having been quite fully trained, I just do basically only restorations. Uh, and well, in strange projects like a Silberman piano or <clears throat> a new play L, I have Play all. I, you know, the French, French romantic pianos and Silberman pianos and restorations are mine to do. And my team, uh, the rest of us make Graf and Stein and Walter Viennese pianos. We just had on radio our Tom Strange of the uh, of a musical instrument museum in, I believe it was South Carolina. Are you yeah. familiar with him at all? No. Yeah, need to make an introduction. Um, he's been into restoring period pianos and conserving them and and uh, putting them on display for, for viewing and even playing uh, within a museum. Uh, so I'll, I'll make sure and connect you too. Um, David Stoneman yes. asks, when comparing forte pianos with the modern piano, what is the defining difference between a modern piano and a forte piano? It's the uh, <clears throat> the thickness of the string, and the immense the, the the composition of the string and the thickness, and they, the the soundboard, and <clears throat> the keyboard, the hammer, and all of these are part and parcel of the proportion of the string thickness, and the uh, soundboard thickness is 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 in one in not entirely 
bound by the parameters of the string thickness, but it all goes in, uh, in close relationship in the proportions of thickness and, you know, hammer mass and those things that you have to juggle to make any piano design. You have to work with these proportions and they vary from period to period and taste to taste. But you could, you could easily always have made an 1830 play L. You could have made easily in 1780. Uh, the technology is not, <clears throat> has not, so to say, uh, gone out of recognition to, to an earlier period, but it's the taste of the, the music and requirements of people's expectations of having an orchestra at home, uh, which the harpsichord was not in the early uh, use of the clavier was, was, uh, <clears throat> was not suggestive of romantic and orchestral qualities. So it changes, tastes changed, and the same materials were used to create different, you know, heavier instruments, we can say. Yeah. Next uh, question here is from Lyle Heorns. Uh, when recovering hammers on a forte piano, is it mm -hmm. similar to replacing back check leather on a modern piano? Is it important no, to stretch? No, you have to, you, you, you need, uh, the more important thing there is, well, one thing you, you, you cannot have at all is any slop in the attachment of the leather to the layer underneath. There can be no air underneath. You will kill a hammer instantly if there's any air or any slop between one layer and the next. It is not to say that you stretch the living daylights out of a piece of leather to attach it. You are more concerned with, um, indeed, with stretching, but more concerned with compression. As much as you can in attaching the layers of a multi-layer hammer, you're, you're, you're concerned with compression. And the same with attaching a felt uh, outer covering to 1846 play all, which I was just doing yesterday. You have to attach them uh, in, in a state of compression in which I have a hand screw with a notch cut into it that can force a hammer, it's, it's under layers of basically shoe leather in, in the play all of 1840s. Uh, on the outside is one layer of felt of whatever dimension, uh, but it, it, it has to be attached in uh, with the nose, the, the the crown in compression as you are fiddling with your fingers to wrap the rest of the thing around the hammerhead. It starts, you are attaching glue, and of course no glue is on the crown, but that's wonderful because the crown is, in, is being held by the clamp, but the rest of it gets slathered with glue. And then you capture this hammer <clears throat> with your fingers and pull it out of the hand screw and immediately wrap a, a piece of Masking tape doubled on itself is a non-adhesive, very strong piece of paper, like a belt. And you wrap this around the hammerhead and attach a spring clamp and press the tail of the hammer against the table and do even more compression. And then, then put the whole thing on the, the, the room heater the, and, and keep, the, keep, the, to keep the glue warm while, it, while you make the next hammer. There's a, there's a procedure in the attachment of these materials which your guy is absolutely right to focus on this question of extension, like stretching the stuff around. You're not, you're gonna do fine with buckskin for, for back checks, but it's not really true that you have, um, <clears throat> you have basically glove leather, sheep, kind of sheep and hair sheep, glove leather as it were, uh, to, to deal with. And I can give sources for vegetable tanned hair sheep uh, in a, an, or leather supplier in Germany, Herzog. But you want, you want to have good, you can't simply go to the local hobby store and get leather. It doesn't, dust doesn't work. In terms of people getting in touch with you, uh, an email address that's good to reach out? Info at fortepiano.eu. Perfect. I'll put that in the chat there. And um, let's see here. Next question here is from 
Dorothy. Wait, I'm not skipping one. No, no, no. Yeah, no, here we go from Wayne. Let's let's go back to Wayne's question. What can you say about the quality of the steel wire being made today compared to back in the day they were first manufactured? Well, the thing which mattered most of all was, was that there were sufficient impurities in the iron mix, which was almost pure, but there were sufficient impurities to prevent this iron from stretching uh, forever, like taffy. Uh, and there are just, it's a bit of phosphorus, uh, but the carbon is what makes this iron into steel. And it's a very low carbon formula, which you find available from people such as Vogel, V-O-G-E-L in Germany. Uh, Vogel and Scher, S-C-H-E-R. In any case, these guys supply harpsichord parts and they make absolutely wonderful iron wire, which will be good up to 1835. After that, you have Webster wire from England, which is mild steel. And from that point, the piano designs across the continent of Europe extended their mensur because they could. They had stronger wire. So a piano of 1840 is going to break the wire of 1830 because it's already mild steel. Next question here is from Dor Dorothy. Yes, can you show a hammer that you're talking yeah. about? A visual would be helpful. Yeah, hold on. Okay, <clears throat> sounds good. Yeah. Maybe I tell a little bit, meanwhile, about small pianos and about our clients, because sure. uh, this is what all questions are coming to me. I am on not only on piano, but I am also on computer. And what I would say that uh, usually uh, nothing happens with our forte pianos like Mozart time and uh, even Schubert time. This, I would think, it can be compared with modern pianos in a way that if you get new piano, then it functions. And if new piano would be like Stanway would be 200 year old, of course, from time, many things uh, would wear and needs to be replaced. So it's really not many questions and almost never they break strings. And things which are happening are mostly accidents. So very popular one is that people are trying to take keyboard out and they press by maybe some sleeve or part of clothes, they press the key. And then of course, hammer is broken and uh, here, uh, I sort of have philosophy that every piano, one time, everyone will break hammer. It just must be. So if something like this happens, put it in envelope with two neighbors, send to us, and we do it, at the moment, we do it for free because it's just sort of general help. Uh, then first, uh, Paul will explain how to take care of them because sometimes they ring on strings and they need to be made more fluffy. Yeah, okay. right? All right. But this is already his topic. And he's with Heimers here. All right. I have two. Um, this is a Walter piano of 1800, basically also 1790, the same hammers. And this is a Graf piano of 1820 about. Yeah. And the, what do I want to say? The, well, how can I describe? You know, the Graf has a whole bunch of, you know, excuse me. Yes, what because is it? What you're is shaking it? this camera. You're shaking the camera. When you press table, the camera shakes. May I? Yeah. Would you Good. Um, anyway, this is a graph with a piles of that's six layers of leather put on with incredible compression, right? And the graph is made with a varying profile from six uh, from six layers in the base and six layers in the treble, and the difference in size depends on the degree of compression. And uh, Graf was known for making his own hammers, and he was a madman. 
uh, he has really dug into this composition of hammer and for this design, which he had still in 1820 with a very light, thin soundboard <clears throat> and very delicate hammers, this is like a middle C. Uh, uh, he, has, he has a gorgeous quality of tone. They're very efficient hammers. If hammers are, comp if hammers it live for being in compression, well, this is a real hammer. And this is a different story. Where am I? Yeah, Valter. Yeah, lift up a little hammer. bit. There you go, excellent. And the Valter has just three layers, right? No, two layers, excuse me, two. I saw, yeah, two layers, and it has uh, a little bit of brass in there. And that brass is because we carved the hammer heads to the indicated weight from the original, which I opened in the year 2000. Excuse me, what is this? No shaking. I'm not. I think we're okay. I think we're okay on the camera. Mine. I'll let I'll let him know. Um. Anyway, the thing is. Quick, quick question, Paul. The brass yes. that you mentioned. Is that uh, like a this layer is just of brass? a correct is this is no this is just in the... a piece of brass wire got it and it, it is intended to correct the weight of hammers which are carved to a schedule derived from my measurements of a piano like 20 years ago an original vulture and the hammer mass is very much part of the formula and so i if i carve too much i put in a little piece of brass and bring it up to scan to standard uh so they're a very regular gradation of uh weight from left to right certainly with Graf, he was he was manically accurate on red Graf. can can i ask some that are part of the building of these things can i ask some questions so i might have missed it those are two different hammers from two different pianos like two that's different true types of yeah this is okay. a piano of 1820, and this is a piano of 1790. But they're both Graf. It's no, both Graf. both from Vienna. One is Graf, and the other is Walter. Okay. Which yeah. one's on? Which so on on your the, right? The, this one, it somewhat smaller head. Yeah. Uh huh. Walter. Walter. And he has. I mean, it's not a very big hammerhead, but they're rather big for his time. He was a rather forward-looking builder made a loud piano, which was why uh, Mozart was fond of him and owned one, and why Beethoven also wrote uh, using a, a, his writing toward the end of the 1790s when he had a Walter in his studio is becoming uh, more experimental in, in, in the range of color he gets from the piano. And then on the one uh, on your left, our right, um, there's sort of like a diamond shape. Oh, these center. are this. Not that one. The other one. It's, this... I see like a point. Like it's like a like a square on its side. Is that wooden? The sort of this thing? center. No, no. On in the actual hammer. Um, oh, in no. This is yeah. Uh, no, it's carved. It's all the carving involved in. Uh, it started out as a full width, uh, uh, linden or bass uh, hammerhead. Mm -hmm. It's carved to weight, hmm. the indicated weight from the example we measured. You know, and the weight is determined by how much this thing is pull, pushing up. And you have a cantilever out here and you have another one on and there's a little piece of lead on a string. And you measure and you write these things down and you reproduce it in the workshop. I'm curious if any. I'm fascinated by just looking at these because I haven't spent much time looking at them. And but you see, it's all it's all carved. They it's it there. It's yeah. It's true, and it uh, it has a certain mass and it has a certain spring to it. <clears throat> and these things are are um, integral to making a piano sound interesting. I'm going to pass on to some of these other questions here that are coming in in the chat. Um, let's see what's next. Don't want to skip anybody. Ellie Weiner 
what is the method of maintaining dampers after a year some notes oh. ring longer now yes there's a little well what longer. you can do if um could you uh, um bring me a damper from a vulture yeah and yes okay do we have a scalpel yeah we have to okay well i'm going to explain that you that you uh what to do and we'll, we'll show you a damper yeah we can come back to it if you need no that. it's like that yeah but uh the the answer is yes you can uh make a quick substantial difference yeah if you have either a chisel or a scalpel, and very briefly, one will come. And then the rest of the question here, just to, to call it out, uh, she was saying, or he actually, I'm not sure who this is, but due to ruts in the damper belt, what is the best way to smooth them? And so this is what you're saying, using a scalpel is a good way. And well, no, it, it, it's, it's a little different than you might, what you might expect. Um, the, the, you're actually making cuts into the uh, damper, which one will appear briefly. And is the damper made of felt? Yeah, we make. No, it's it's uh, leather. It's leather, actually, right? So here's a damper, right? Mm -hmm. And you see there's a string mark. There's a string mark, right? Mm -hmm. A groove on the right there, yeah. Yeah, and on the other side as well. Okay. And what happens is, is a mash gilette go nebozo? Proceed. Nebozato. So anyway, uh, someone's going to bring me a knife or... Here we are. Scalpel. So here's what I do. I'm going to try to do it. If I look on the screen, it won't make any sense to me. But I'm holding it and I'm lift it up a little bit. There, there it is. Go. I'm slicing it. I'm putting these slices across the string marks at an oblique angle. You know? And it doesn't look very nice. Uh, but it certainly does the job. And you can lift just lift it up a little bit. Oh sorry. There you go. And who knows what if, if you try to focus i'll try to focus and then you sneak in there oh lord i'm going to try to make it so you can see it right i'm turning the thing and i'm finding my oblique angle and i slice into the leather at, at and i make little ears i didn't do very well because i can't see what i'm doing right. but you're making little leather ears on the damper and yeah, you, you see them, right? Mm -hmm. And that, since these cuts, they transverse, they cut across the string groove, you're making, mechanically moving the leather out and these little ears just make it completely quiet. And you can do this the next year too, but it'll last for some time. And is what would be the and it might way be to- standing on strings. Maybe he needs to cut the also. Oh, there are other issues involved uh, with uh, <clears throat> dampers that what, what happens, of course, is that dampers uh, continually sink deeper into the string. And eventually they will be touching, they'll be standing on the key. Um, and then there that you will hear that maybe you won't hear it right away or maybe it'll be terribly obvious the damper won't work at all but if you have a if you play staccato and hear kind of a bounce then perhaps the the damper is not seating quite well uh, there needs to be air lost motion under the damper jack this is the damper jack and there needs to be lost motion under here uh, <clears throat> in relation to this key, where am I? You see? That. It can't stand on the key. There has to be a tiny bit of lost motion. And what you do is take out the jack and cut the bottom. Hmm. And if you have uh, 
a little, if you see any visible air under this thing between the damper lifter thing, and the, if you see any air at all, you're okay. That's with, I hope that makes sense. With adding those ears to the damper leather, just uh, if there is an answer, what is something that maybe a common mistake or a way that that could go wrong? Just, you know. Oh, uh, nobody ever does. Do it it's right. just no. It it it's just nobody ever does it, which is why mm -hmm. nothing gone wrong. Uh, <laughs> the answer: uh, you can you can get a toothbrush and start polishing your damper heads and scratching, and that does basically nothing. Uh, if you mechanically impose this this disturbance in the shape of the damper as it meets the string. And that little ear of leather is just going to be there for the next century. Uh, it, it, it's more long lasting and it works. It works right away. And you, and you haven't, you know, you can always put more leather on, but you can't remove the oinking sound of such a damper by any other way that I know. And, and you said people don't do this, but would you discourage the, the, people nobody, from doing nobody this? Ever looks, nobody ever looks at their piano. They just play them. But uh, I, I, I wait for the phone to ring. Okay. So if somebody, but you wouldn't discourage somebody from doing this if, if they. No, no, no. I don't. I say it. that. I say that they, if they have any concern, call me first. But otherwise, have at it. You know. Have at it. Yes. Excellent. All right, let's see here. Alan Day, do you have a relationship with the folks at Frederick Collection outside of Boston? I've never met the them. Museum? I've never actually met them. Yeah, they've been there forever. And, and I may have, I was there 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and I knew of them, but we never met. And what is it, just an instrument collection, mostly pianos? They, they are in uh, Ashburnham or somewhere in, in Western Massachusetts, and they have a collection of 19th century pianos. Excellent. Yeah. We'll have to get them on the radio hour. That should be fun. I have a question here from Lyle again, Lyle Hjorns. Uh, he's had issues with strings breaking on a collared and collared forte piano from the mid-1800s. It was restrung with a pure sound wire a few years ago. Any recommendation uh, for well, the correct the, strings the, for that instrument? Well, the thing about pure sound is, it is, I understand, and maybe this is only folklore, but it is distempered shark wire, I believe, shark fishing wire. Be that as it may, uh, the, the Webster wire firm, which supplied Europe with, Eng uh, supplied Europe with piano wire, from 1840, that same factory supplies uh, Paolello. Stephen Paolello uh, is a piano designer in France, and he makes an excellent uh, range of wire, piano wire. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> he has three or four different grades, up to and including modern. Uh, and I can't remember the the sequence of his piano grade, piano wire grades, but he will uh, certainly for a mid-century piano, there's easily a solution. He has a, uh, a wire calculation, string percentage breaking and so forth uh, in harmonicity. One of these programs, uh, an Excel program from his website, where you can put these things in and figure it out before you string it up. It, it, you're testing his various gauges, if you understand me, in their application for said piano. All right. So next, I have something from Nick Gravania. Welcome, Nick. Another presenter here. Um, are the hammer weights related to the string mass? Well, yes. It's like that. The um, you know the speech of an instrument is depending a lot on the soundboard thickness. And if you if you have, for example, the Stein piano of, of 1770, whatever it is, uh, the soundboard is is, is 2.2 millimeters in the treble. It's like a lute. It speaks immediately, very quickly, but you cannot have a heavy hammer. Uh, 
Yes, that the, the it has to speak so quickly that the hammer has to get out of the way. There's no mass. The 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 formula on such a piano, the Johann Andreas Stein, is zero mass. The hammer weighs nothing. If we have a keyboard out, Muschmann and Stein, yeah, and the uh, the Stein piano has has no mass in the hammerhead, and it's also the fastest keyboard possible. It's the hammer is moving 10 times faster than your finger when your finger's on the key. And that's more than twice of what you're getting on the Steinway keyboard. Steinway piano is uh, the, the weight of the speed of the hammer is 4.8 times the speed of the finger. Uh, in any case, the, the very fast, the speed of the hammer shank in the Stein, even though there is no mass involved, it is the speed which is giving the energy to the system of the thin string and the thin soundboard. That goes together. That's interesting, yeah, that, that you can play much qu more quickly. Well, it wears a graph, and I showed you the, the, the graph, hammer, shank, clavicell, motion. This, um, whereas the graph, uh, the graph and Walter hammerheads are heavier and their strings are thicker and their soundboards are a bit thicker. Uh, but these are not traveling at 10 to 1. They're not traveling 10 times faster than your finger. They're traveling seven times faster than your finger. And so there is more, there is more substance in the hammerhead. And here, for example, is a Stein, the top hammer or the sort of the top hammer but there's absolutely no mat the hammer weighs nothing and you see the different the ratio is insanely fast i i think you can see that right it's a very yes. fast, just a very deep hammer shank but a very thin one right wow. yeah uh and the mass there's just nothing there's no um there's no mass to to be expected from this little thing but it is delivering there is energy in the speed of the system you get one or the other you get inertia or you get speed yes yeah, i feel like one of the reasons that that these pian that these period pianos that are sort of lighter and quieter can have a special new emergence in this day and age is we have other means of amplification now. Um, you, know, you don't have to just make the instrument loud all on its own. Um, yeah. Well, no, it it it's a it quickly. I, everybody in the piano world knows that it's a losing game to uh, insist forever on loudness. Uh, you you start to lose rather more than you gain, but there is uh, there within the confines of a piano design you can find out what is possible uh and you certainly compare it with the repertoire available and these and you know given the ensemble and the the venue available these uh the pianos of mozart's time were capable of of uh sitting in an ensemble with the orchestra and playing concertos uh, and you, you know that, uh, <clears throat> what do I mean? You have to know that in the same way that Anton Rubinstein in his book, Music and Its Masters, supposed that Mozart must have had a fine-toned grand piano, nothing like these miserable spinets we see in the museum. Uh, and he supposed that it's a pity that the pianos had gone so far out of repair that it was not possible to know how they sounded, but certainly they must have been effective. And he was right. And he proposed in 1892 that somebody ought to learn how to make them. Certainly those piano makers of his day knew nothing about those instruments. So it was a challenge he raised in 1892 and it's still, you know, still upon us. Let me get to the next question here from David Skolnick. Uh, he asks, which type of leather uh, is used for dampers? Deer, oil tanned deer leather. 
Um, is there, in, in terms of obtaining these type of materials, has this been? Um, it's difficult. You don't just get. It isn't. It, it's. It is not every skin which will yield you the soft leather you need, and no tanner can tell you which of his next batch of skins are going to be soft enough. But you make a deal with somebody, and when they do run across some of their soft material, if they remember you, you'll get it. But you have to find it. You have to. Um, you have to go looking. If you if you look for uh ray leather and roe deer leather is pretty safe in this respect maybe a little bit softer in general from this herzog h-e-r-z-o-g and it's uh if you write herzog leather germany you'll get there uh and they have Ray leather, what's called ray leather, row a uh, row deer leather, which works well for dampers in some hammers. Thank you for that. Um, Alan Eder asks the keys you shared have a step on the back end where the lifter felt would be in a modern piano, but that is not where the damper interface occurs on the vaulter or graph. Why then is that step there? This one here? Exactly. Well, that's at the back end of the keyboard and there's a rail above and that forms the limit to the key travel. Yeah? See what I'm, my finger is so the it's, rail it's... to which, you know, the back rail is where my finger is and the key goes up and stops there. So it kind of, it stops the key stops. short. Is that part of what, um, like allows the hammer to then move with momentum. It's kind of like no, it 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 is it, the key bottoms out in the modern piano on the Erard designed double escapement mechanism. You have something called aftertouch, and you have to have that in the modern piano or it won't play. And but you don't need aftertouch at all in the English mechanism or the Viennese mechanism. And the depth of touch, which I showed you, is controlled by where this hits, yes? Is also controlled by little bits of paper and whatever, which are glued there. Do you understand? Yeah? And those th the depth of touch is determined precisely by the moment the hammer escapes is when the key is felt to find some resistance at the end of the touch. And so there's a zero after touch in a Viennese mechanism. Got it. I have a question here from Annika Byerly. Action is clearly simpler than a modern grand piano. What adjustments can or should a technician make in regulating the action or troubleshooting the keys that aren't working or making unwanted noises? Ah, well, the first thing is to make the keys go up and down. And if you take a, uh, a drill bit one tenth of a millimeter bigger than the balance pin or front pin you find in that keyboard, probably 2.5 millimeters. So I put a 2.6 millimeter drill backwards in a hand drill. That is the stem of that 2.6 millimeter drill is becoming what I will use to burnish the holes. You burnish the holes and you burnish the key buttons and you burnish the front, whatever that is, molding. No, whatever that is, the end of this thing. Uh, yeah, this has leather. This is a different story. That has a bushing. Graf has a bushing. But where you have a piano with just wooden, these are Lipa, a Linden uh, key buttons in front, whatever that is. Yes? And these, uh, they obviously can't bind on the string, but they, they can't rattle. So if you make them by virtue of burnishing with a 2.6 millimeter stem of a drill, not the flute part, uh, then you make it 
so that it's free but not rattling. And that's the key, and the rest of it is escapement. You